Hi, I'm Sebastian. This is the first part of the tutorial, uh, a deep dive into latent space image generation manipulation with Stalgon 2. I'm going to give an overview of theory and background. And the idea is to give an explanation of the particular architectural choices in Stalgon 2, uh, how they differ from other GANs, also provide some background information on the evolution, so how what these uh, changes were motivated by. Um, and it's best to know uh, the basics ar architecture of uh, guns and the training setup. Although I'm going to go over, uh, over it slightly in a, in a, mi in a minute. Um, this is also very uh, inspired by Peter Beale's course at UC Berkeley, Deep Unsupervised Learning, especially lectures five and six on implicit models, which in total I think are four hours long. So this is rather a compressed version of that, focusing on Stargon only. But I sh really should, uh, you should really um, go back to, to those lectures and uh, have a closer look if you're interested. I really encourage you to check out that resource. Um, so the original generative adversarial network formulation from 2015, and the idea of an implicit model is to start with a uh, sampled latent code Z typically from a Gaussian distribution, um, which is then passed through a neural network in order to obtain a sample X, usually an image. Uh, and this formulation is similar to variation autoencoders uh, and flows, but essentially also very different because it does not do any explicit density information. That's why it calls an, an implicit model. The generator uh, induces uh, a density, but it's not explicitly expressed. And the, this cannot thus be trained uh, with likelihood methods. Instead, uh, this model is trained in an adversarial fashion where you have two parts, two networks, generator and discriminator playing a minimax game against each other. Generator uh, generates fa uh, fake images. Um, the discriminator has to distinguish whether an image is fake or real. And if the uh, setup is well balanced, they will ideally find a Nash equilibrium, but it's a whole different other story. Um, so style gun compared to other uh, gun architectures has two major changes or different choices that make it very special. Uh, the first one is the choice of a um, style vector or the idea of a style vector. Uh, the second adaptive instance normalization is also inspired by um, the style transfer literature, and we're going to have a closer look later. Um, one of the first differences um, of style gun to other guns is that the latent code Z is usually uh, put into the model through the input layer right at the beginning. And then it's kind of passed on through the model, and, and the model doesn't look at the, uh, at the latent code again. Instead, uh, Stylegun starts this upsampling process from uh, a constant vector, which is fixed one time at the beginning of training. And the latent code instead is transformed into a style vector. Also, after every deconvolution, the generator adds some random noise. Uh, and the style vector is applied uh, to the convolution through adaptive instance normalization. So this style vector, um, starting from the latent code, it's first transformed into an intermediate latent space W and then further transformed to be later the style vector Y. And the first part of this uh, transformation is essentially learned mapping of the initial latent code Z to the intermediate latent space W. And this is done through an eight layer multi-layer perceptron so fully connected layers, no convolutions. Um, and eight layers, this is actually uh, a parameter which you could change if you wanted to um, to train your own models. Uh, I guess eight was the one that worked, worked best and had a good trade-off between cost and benefit. And this latent space W is um, actually designed to be disentangled. So let's have a look at what that's supposed to do. So um, in the illustration, we have three different uh, 
spaces. And the, the one on the left, let's start with that uh, and assume that we have a data set that is, uh, has linearly separate uh, factors of variation. And the, um, and the example of human faces, for example, we could think of uh, the y-axis as the length of hair and the x-axis as age. And for some reason, we don't have any images of old people with long hair in the top left corner. So this, this would be a space that in the data is kind of is missing. Um, but since the latent code Z uh, typically comes from a Gaussian distribution, um, it has this particular shape that forces the mapping from Z to X to be curved. Um, and then the missing part in the top left corner gets kind of warped. And the idea of the intermediate latent space W is um, to unwarp this space and to recover the previous linear uh, factors of var variations. Um, and this is and this is possible because the internet intermediate uh, latent space W does not have to support sampling. We only so sample from Z, pass it through the MLP, and then the generator can, can work with that intermediate latent space. And it is assumed that the generator is pressured into doing this, uh, this disentangling, uh, learned disentangling, um, because it's, it favors the generation of uh, realistic images. So uh, if I can choose um, length of hair and age in, in images, uh, I have better a better way of convincing the discriminator that this is a real image. That's the basic idea. Then uh, let's move on to the second part of the transformation of the style vector, which is uh, essentially a learned affine transform um, from W to Y. And Y is separ separated into two, two parts, which we're going to look at later. Um, and this style vector is uh, then used to control adaptive instance normalization. And adaptive instance normalization, as I mentioned earlier, uh, comes from um, style transfer literature. Um, what it does is calculate the statistics um, of one instance. So we look at every single image, uh, every single single channel individually and calculate mean and standard deviation only over the spatial dimension, so width and height. And in a second step, um, we apply an affine transform again to the normalized image. And in the style transfer literature, this was usually scale and offset from a reference image. So you, you would typically apply the statistics of uh, an image that you wanted um, to use as a style reference. In style gun, though, this affine transform is controlled by the style vector y, which we saw earlier. So this is where y, ys and yb come in as scale and offset. So let's put this all together. Um, in the graphic on the right-hand side, you see on the left side the traditional uh, architecture of a, of a gun. Uh, and on the right-hand side, the style gun uh, specialization. Um, Left-hand side, side starts with a latent uh, code Z, which is normalized and passed into the model um, and then passed on through the network. Uh, whereas you can see on the right-hand side that the latent uh, Z is first passed on through the mapping network, fully connected layers, um, transformed into the intermediate latent space W and only then passed on uh, to all, all the style blocks in the model. And instead, the model starts with a um, constant in the beginning uh, and then has this um, style vector added to the for before and after the convolutions um, at every step of the, of the upsampling process. It also induces noise, uh, which you can see on the right hand side. So the little boxes labeled A uh, refer to the learned uh, affine transform uh, from style vector to adaptive instance normalization. And B refers to the learned uh, per channel scaling factors of the noise input. And in total, there are 18 convolutional layers, um, two layers for each of the nine resolutions. So 
um, there are, I think, eight blocks, no, eight upsampling steps, nine blocks, eight upsampling steps. And the re resolution is essentially doubled at each upsampling step. So from four by four, we go to eight by eight, to 16, to 32, to 64, and so on until we reach 1024 by 1024 pixels. And um, this upsampling process is actually comes from the pro progressive growing uh, GAN, which was developed in 2019 um, by the same team at NVIDIA. So you can go back and look at that paper uh, to see where, where that idea comes from. So Stalgan 2 um, was a minor update on this on this version, and it's mostly addressing two uh, flaws in the images that the authors noted. Uh, one of them is called water droplets, and it has to do with uh, instance normalization. And the others are phase artifacts, um, and this has to do with pro progressive growing. Um, so we're going to look at what those mean. Um, first, the water droplets are these uh, small bits of um, noise, not ne not necessarily noise, but uh, maybe you wouldn't even be able to see it, but these people really uh, care a lot about image quality, they're, they're graphics people, so they wanted to get this right. Um, and it turned out, they've put in a lot of work of, of analyzing this, and it turned out that it's actually related to uh, the adaptive instance normalization. Um, you, you could go back to the paper and read up on the on the details, but the changes that they introduced in Stargon 2 to fix this is um, instead of normalizing by standard deviation and mean, they only normalize by standard devi deviation and leave the mean untouched. Um, so we could, could essentially scratch this uh, term in the in the formula on top. Um, and this whole operation is uh, actually refactored as a demodulation operation. Again, I think the details is best to look at the paper. Um, but for now, uh, I think that's enough to understand the, the idea. Uh, another problem, the phase ar artifacts that they wanted to fix um, happened whenever you would rotate a phase, uh, some of the details would still be aligned with the center of the image. In this case, you can see how the center of the teeth doesn't rotate together with a, with a face itself. Um, so it turned out that this had to do with progressive growing. So the, the idea of doubling the resolution at each upsampling step, which they had uh, previously introduced uh, in a previous paper. Um, so to fix this, the authors uh, decided to to replace the simple feed-forward design of Stalgon version one, and instead um, used skip connections in the generator, as you can see on the illustrating um, on the right right hand side, uh, not labeled A, and residual connections in the discriminator on the right hand side at the bottom, and this is um, implemented in the configurations E and F um, of Stalgon two. There are other configurations because they did a lot of ab ablation studies to see what uh, architectural choices had what kind of influence. Um, but I think E and well, probably F is the most uh, the most used one, and uh, also the one that we're going to use in the in the tutorial. Uh, another important um, part is the truncation trick, uh, which was originally introduced in in the Big M paper. Uh, we're also going to use this in um, in the tutorial, and the, uh, the the proposed method is that during training you um, sample the latent codes from the normal distribution as as usual as you you would always do, but in post training uh, you clip the sample um, latents such that they lie in a defined range, and resample the values that fall outside outside of the range, and the idea is to to have truncated sampled codes uh, in order to produce more realistic images. And the effect can be seen here uh, at this graphic from the from the original Big End paper. Um, so we go from a uh, range threshold of 2 over 1, 0 0.5, and 0 0.04 from left to right. 
And in the most extreme cases on the right hand side, you can see how um, the limited range kind of means that we regress to the mean. So we all, always produce the most average image there is. Um, I guess you can imagine if you limit the, the samples from a Gaussian distribution to a specific range, you will never be really uh, sampling outside of the most probable regions. And this is essentially uh, an improvement in individual sample quality, but as you can imagine at the cost of the reduction uh, in overall uh, sample variety. It does help in providing boost, uh, providing a boost to uh, the inception score and, and fresh at uh, inception distance, which are typical measures for, for gun performance. But in my understanding, it's mostly um, a, it comes with a trade-off of uh, progressively uh, regressing to the mean and um, producing more average uh, samples. So with this information, um, I think you're good to go uh, and check out the second part of the of the tutorial, um, we have a live Q and A set up. Uh, so for any questions that you might have, any problems, uh, th theoretical nature or practical nature, um, next Monday, 7th of September, uh, first session in the morning uh, at uh, European time at 9 a.m. Um, session two, European time, uh, 5 p.m. Uh, we're gonna be available for, for any questions that you have. Um, thank you and hope to see you there and uh, have fun with the tutorial. Thanks.